the weekly show with David J. Maloney. This week, David chats with legendary Yes guitarist Steve Howe. And now, here's your host, David J. Maloney. Welcome, everyone, to the weekly show. I'm your host, David J. Maloney. On tonight's show, we've got the next part of my interview with legendary guitarist Steve Howe. Steve's name is enshrined in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, along with that of his most famous band, Yes. And the depth and breadth of his musical projects and connections has seen him work with pretty much every influential artist in the progressive rock world for the past 50 years. Here, after the break, to finish chatting about his incredible career is none other than guitarist Steve Howe. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Before I move on to Fragile, I'd like to ask about, I've seen all good people. Um, uh, it's been a favorite of mine since the, the first time I heard it. Um, what's the story behind the creation of that song? And when did the Spanish Laud guitar come into the picture? Um, okay. Well, I mean, we had the song. Um, as we do in the S album, we, we seem to have an intuitive idea that not every song should just be played, you know? And I think most probably Bill was quite like that, you know? Not every song should just be, like, treated the same. And that's what we were trying to do, find different ways of treating it. So, basically, um, uh, uh, every song got a chance to be recorded in somewhat of a way. If you take event, adventure, you know, that... That's not, that's not like we just saying, let's just play this song, you know. It was a very careful arrangement. And delightfully, some, somehow it came about that the idea to do Your Move was not for us to play it together, you know. That in fact, we do a production, what's called a production job on it. We'd set up something, and then we'd overdub the parts and get them really, you know, pristine, get every focus on one thing at a time instead of Eddie having to record bass, drums, and guitar, which was usually what we did at one time sometimes with a keyboard at the same time, or sometimes a keyboard and a bass and drums, but, you know, sometimes all of us, you know, and John doing the guide vocal. So that's a big task. So differently on your move, we set up a pulse, you know, and um, that was, that was created like it was in the those days, but was, was with a loop tape going across two machines. And on it was just Chris and Bill going, boom, 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 boom. In fact, it was boom, boom. Boo, boo, you know, two beats slightly different. So anyway, we had the loop guy, boo, 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 boo. So I went out and I had that guitar. It's actually called a Portuguese 12 string guitar. And um, I'll be playing it, you know, on this tour as I do. And basically that, um, what, I, what was required was that I had to have a concept of how many times everything would go around and when there would be a chorus. So in other words, when the guitar wouldn't keep doing the verse, but it would like kind of do the chorus approach. Um, and, you know, put a load of that down for a few minutes on my own and uh, maybe track it as well. Um, but anyway, so the Portuguese guitar sounded, the, the guitar sounded great. The boom, boom, boom. And then I was doing all this. So we had basically a structure that was really nailed down, you know, pinned down to the ground, as we say. It was tight. It was beautiful. It was clean. And the band hadn't played anything yet. <laughs> so then we started, John puts a voice on, you know, and I never wanted to put another guitar on it, you know, because there was not going to be like this guitar comes in. It's like, ding, 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 ding. so um, because that was all going to happen later, you know, the delayed approach, you know, when you get to, you know, the next part of the song, we, uh, we then went to a live band, you know, playing live, you know, playing in the studio. So basically that's, that's the story. It was a production job. And, you know, we 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 did, we did that with a new and I. You know, we did the same thing. We didn't stand in the studio for hours. You know, <laughs> arguing about how to play it. We we set something in motion, like agreed an arrangement. There'll be so many verses, and then something will happen. You know, and then we'll take a. So that was another tracked up kind of guitar. In fact, that I did track that up with several guitars, and um, so that that that's a, a lovely approach. That yes. Cleverly, didn't didn't overuse it, but you know sometimes we're not playing in, even back then. You know we're not playing all at once, and it does allow Eddie Offord at the time, who was our co-producer, and us as co-producers, and the musicians to kind of um, to kind of develop it slower without having to um, you know get it get it collectively. You know we we, we could focus on it individually. Whose idea was it to incorporate uh, John Lennon's lyrics, all we were saying is give peace a chance, into the background? 
I can't guarantee who thought of that. Um, some of those little ideas sometimes re it really does get forgotten who who actually thought of them. Um, so an idea like that is uh, is kind of haunting. I think we were kind of worried that the Beatles might be offended or they might you know hit us up for some publishing or something. And um, but we didn't care. It, it seemed so right to us. So in a way, we were joining the crusade of the sixties, you know, in the hopes. I mean, I could say something now, but I mean, you know, I would almost tire hearing myself say it, that there are so many problems which we've known about for so long that have not been fixed. One has to say, is it too late to fix anything? You know, because mm. all we are saying is give peace a chance. But there you are. You know, we were talking about war, which is also happening today. And we've also not, the, the human race has not learned that war is bad. It's destructive, you know. So, I mean, you know, give me a break. All we're saying is give peace a chance. But that was back then, just like Joni Mitchell said about the spots on the apples. And another guy I quoted one night on stage is called Alexandra Humboldt. Bet nobody's heard of him. 200 years ago, he went to South America and he saw them cutting down the rainforest. So mm. what did he say? 200 years ago, he came back and reported to Europe that, we're destroying the planet. Wow. 200 years? I mean, look, it's not the politicians' fault. It's not the police' fault. It's not the army's fault. It's nobody's fault but the human race. And we've got to take a grip. We've got to do that ourselves. We have to be better. You know, and it's not about the politicians. It's not. It's about the human race actually waking up one day and saying, we're going to stop doing all the bad stuff and just do the good stuff. Coming off that, I was going to ask Please. you one other question, but that was, be, being as that was kind of heavy, I'm still going to ask the question anyway uh, about, uh, you know, I've seen all good people. I mean, is that song as fun for you all to play as it is for the audience to hear and sing along with? Because you got the hook, you got the did it, did it, did it, did it, did it. And mm. all everybody just loves singing that, you know, it, mm. all, it brings out the little kid in everybody. You know what I mean? Well, there's the two parts. Yeah, I mean, you, you're kind of partly referring to, you know, the first part. Yeah. But the second part, which is, you know, I've seen all the people turn their heads. Yeah. You know, basically, yes, almost missed the boat sometimes in the 70s to, by forgetting that we're actually fundamentally a rock band. Look at Roundabout. <laughs> Jenny, ding, ding, mm -hmm. ding, ding. You know, you see, we got all the trademarks of being a rock band, but we kind of brought a little twist to it, which was our skill, you know. But, you know, so that that's really the, 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 the beautiful thing about some of our music that it emphasizes in, in a lovely way that we're actually still got the rock mentality. And I value that very, very highly. And that's why on, you know, some of our recent records, you know, we've done stuff like um, uh, Mystery Tour and we did Living Out Their Dreams, which, which are fundamentally rock music with a few twists, you know. And I think we should be proud that we're still able to find that because, you know, you don't want to get too esoteric. You don't want to get too arty. You know, you get kind of overly, you know, you know, uh, kind of weighty and Wagner-esque or something. I'd rather be Vivaldi-esque and not Wagner-esque. You know, I'd rather be bright and happy. And I think one of the trademarks of Yes, the great Yes parts, is that we're not, we use minor to really, push it home because basically we're a very major kind of group when you look at yours is no disgrace you know the, the the minor chords only come in occasionally with the doom laden you know darkness but a lot of our music it's bright and and i think that's so great like you know what happened to this song we once knew so well you know even if the lyrics aren't optimistic you know the music is you know and mm -hmm. I, and i think that's that's important that we that we've always been a band that you know, like when you think about the doors, you know, <laughs> come on, baby, love me. It's very kind of minor <laughs> doors. You know, it's very minor s. It's kind of dark. And and I think yes, we're very proud to be a bright band. You know, a major band. You mentioned Roundabout, um, uh, and uh, next album, Fragile. Um, what was the band's first impression of what you and John had been working on with that song? I mean, who came up with the intro? First of all, I guess. Well, I'm sorry, I did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'm a specialist, if not a maniac, about it, it, beginnings and endings. I've written most of Yes's beginning and ending. I'm not saying that with egotism, 
But when you look at it, a lot of the stuff that, that like Siberian Couture, you know, exactly the same. I, I do write intros and I love developing outros because, you know, what happens in the middle is anybody's game. But uh, yeah, I've taken control and I did have the, you know, obviously, I mean, like, if you hear me playing on my own, you, you know, it, it has to come from me because nobody tells me to play on my yeah. own very often. There's, there's enough of it already, for good to say. So, but then I believe I thought of the backward piano too, because somewhere else, you know, the backward piano had come in, uh, in the, in the, in the, um, well, backward, backward guitar had come in. That's right. With the Beatles doing, uh, George had done some backward guitar and things. So, I mean, back with piano, you know, and, you know, we recorded an E minor backwards and the C major backwards and, oh, but no, sorry, recorded them forwards, obviously, and then played them back. And we all went, oh, wow, that'll be great. How do we line it up? So Eddie was great at this kind of thing, editing and lining up machines. So we got those chords to line up where they where they were uh, on the on the record now. And, I mean, that, 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 again, is the originality the band demanded. I mean, it's the opportunity for me to bring forward ideas that nobody thought about. In fact, Roundabout has quite a contribution. Well, I mean, my contribution has been partly acoustic guitar. And yeah. I used to worry that people wouldn't recognize who was playing the guitar because it wasn't number 175 or my other guitars that I used in the 70s, you know, my electric work. And and I was delighted that Roundabout was so successful because, you know, there's a lot of acoustic guitar on there. And uh, basically, um, it's me. <laughs> but one of the secrets to that sound, if people want to play that intro, is not to use a plectrum, because I never do on stage. When I do those intros and midsection, and, and they're, they're with, really playing with, with my thumb. Not with my nail, like classical guitars, because mm -hmm. I don't do that anyway, because my, my nails are very short, and I don't use that approach, even on a Spanish guitar. I play it in a, quite a medieval way, of um, using my thumb and the, my fingertips, which have to get used to it when they've had a bit of a holiday from it. But um, yeah, so intros, love them. You know, give me a, give me another intro to sort out. You know, and look at a new and die. I mean, I could go on. I, I, yeah. I, I, look at close to the edge. Day 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 day. I mean, that was a close to the edge idea. Was totally. We said this often. You know, but John McLaughlin's. Marvishan Orchestra were one of the most inspiring groups that that yes collectively enjoyed. You know we all had our favourite things we we liked, but Marvishan was was a wonderful band, and we you know we were destined to play with them and admire them. And basically, we were trying to be a bit of Marvishan there by starting with a sort of improvisational feel where it was what's going on, you know what's happening instead of usually what an intro is. You know it establishes your attention and draws you in. And we did that in a different way with Close to the Edge. I mean, we had the birds, first of all, going through a, 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 a moog mm -hmm. uh, and then filtered with, you know, various, like, great effects on it. So, basically, then we go into hurtling into what sounds like improvisation. And Chris Squire was great here because he said, oh, you can't have improvisation without structure. And I go, yeah, okay, I agree with that. If everybody <laughs> improvised... That's yes, such a never... bass player quote. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's got to have some structure here. But, you know, Chris was... Oh, right. Because sadly, and I say this quite seriously, sadly, yes, we're not really an improvising band. You know, if, if we all improvised, it was chaos. You know, I mean, well, and, really, that's why there's no recordings anywhere of us doing that because we weren't any good at that. But what we could do is we set up some structure. That structure could come from me or could come from anybody. Get a structure and then, then yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an open book. I can improvise more or less on anything. You know whether it's one chord or, or or sixty-five chords, I can do that. Uh, there's something I do, and and many musicians can do that. Not everybody does it, and in a way, Chris wasn't so much of an improviser. He was very thoughtful, and he wanted structure, and he that's what he gave to Close to the Edge. So going on behind what appears you know to be a lot of crazy noodling for me is 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 a structure that's based on. You know the riff that came that came out uh, of Close to the Edge, which was quite complicated, and eventually we all play it together, and that's the marvelous thing about structure. You know, it brings you together, but it allows also to be an invisible backdrop to something else. You know, another song off Fragile with a great guitar intro, um, and ironically, it came on my car last night. Um, was Heart of the Sunshine. Um, and, and oh, the wow, sunrise. Yeah. sunrise. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um. I, wow. I had forgotten how cool mm -hmm. the bass playing is in that. Oh yeah. Uh. I mean, it's just. Uh, it, it's it's almost funky. I mean, it's 
Yeah. It's... Oh, yeah. Well, a couple of things happened there. Uh, Chris Chris wrote that riff. <laughs> we had that. And everybody thought it was great, you know, but we said, is it a bit uh, King Crimson? Are you sure it's not King Crimson? Because King, King Crimson did have riffs a little bit like that nail biting kind of edginess that, that Fred was writing and things. So anyway, it, it, it passed the test. This was yes, because what yes did was um, we got tired of playing the riff. We said, but where's the riff going? You know, what are we going to do with this riff? And um, so Bill, uh, Bill Bruford uh, verbally improvised. He kind of said this, he kind of leant off from the drums. He said, well, why, why don't we play something like, blah, 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 blah. you know, give me something like that. Blah, 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 blah. Give me something to do here. You know, I'm just... You know, he didn't like playing straight. He didn't want did, 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 did some phrasings. So uh, it, it's too long to be too long ago to be sure, but I I think I got together with him and he went, da, 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 da. okay, that, you like that, dude. Da, 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 ba, bum, ba, bum. So between Rick, me, and everybody else, you know, we 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 got that hook, hooky bit that 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 ties it together, you know, so you, periodically, da, 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 and very few people, that are other people that play it ever get a couple of the beats right or the way that we feel they're right. They go, da, 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 Those are not in time. You know, no. I've heard people play them with a rigid beat behind, da, 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 and, and that's wrong. But you got to, you, you have to know that phrase, and the band collectively would, would learn that phrase. So... That, that was the beautiful thing. You know, I was right. We were all at the same musical potential of the skills and and the use of technology, you know, the use of really good sound. I mean, Chris had that Rickenbacker. I mean, I swear by Rickenbackers. And not because I want to sound like Chris, because I can't, but it's one of the greatest bass, play, bass, bass yeah. guitars you, you can have. You know, sure, Fender Precision and Jazz, they're all over the world, but uh, uh, all over the place. But the Rickenbacker basses are, 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 have a phenomenal character. Now, let me tell you something about that very brief. When you play them on their own, and you say, is this, is this sound? Is this all right? And yeah, I think it's all right, boom, boom. And then you put it with other instruments. Something really magical happens. And this happened to Chris. You know, he put his Rickenbacker with the other instruments, and it sounded even better. Than it did because you know on on their own they don't always sound that impressive but they sound very impressive when they're surrounded by other good sounds. The first seven Yes albums and and by the way I asked the same question when I interviewed your prior other bandmate Steve Hackett about his time with Genesis. Oh yeah. Um, which one of the first seven Yes albums do you think has aged best in your mind? Well, I mean, I think there's two that have aged exceptionally well, you know, and that's Close to the Edge and Drama. You know, because w w dramas, uh, you know, w was a refined version of yes that, that appealed to some and, and not to others at that time. But over the years, it's gained a kind of strength, not only by us playing the whole thing on stage in our album series tours that we do every now and again. And we were doing last year, of course, with the Close to the Edge uh, album series. So basically, those albums um, have have a lot of solidness. I mean, you know, we lucked out having Eddie off, and I, I give him credit where it's due. He had a, a Brit engineer skill, and he was leaning production, you know, so he was helping us pick pick takes. But, he, you know, I, I watched him. Like, I've watched all the engineers and producers I've worked with, like a hawk, you know, I see what they're up to, and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah I see, I see. That's a good trick. And he was great with editing, you know, and that's the, fundamentally in the early years, there were only a few things you could do with sound, you know. Um, and, but one of the things you could do that was very, very historic was, was editing. And therefore you could, you know, develop, uh, you could de rearrange the song, you know, much like we do today with Pro Tools. You could rearrange it by editing or you could perfect the takes by, by editing between different takes. And that was seen to be, you know... But so Eddie's skill comes through on, on Close to the Edge. But there again, what happens on drama is totally different because there you've got a different kettle of fish altogether. You've got Hugh Padgham, who went on to be, uh, you know, very successful with Phil Collins and Genesis and everything mm -hmm. like that. But also Trevor Horn as a singer and writer, fantastic writer. Um, so he comes in the band and we were all getting more and more interested in how things sounded and what you could do and, 
you know, so the teamwork on that, although Eddie did recall some of the backing tracks for three weeks, you know, we didn't get on. That There was no way we could do the whole album with Eddie, unfortunately. Um, so that that was a rekindling and a hopeful rekindling of our relationship with, that ended somewhere in the mid-70s with, with uh, Eddie uh, on being, you know, having a lot of fun on, stay, on, on tours. And then it broke the pattern of us being able to work in the studio. So, but drama had that teamwork. I mean, the, the, the amount of input on those records, you know, I, I've shown that I've had, you know, production ideas all the way through playing the guitar. But I mean, Trevor, you know, established himself as a producer and then Hugh Padgham did as well. So we had an awful lot of help on that album. And, um, uh, you know, it, 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 like Close to the Edge, it's pretty outstanding. There's there's so much yes history you can talk about, but I'd love to move on to your current album, Mirror to the Sky, which has come out to, I mean, fantastic acclaim from fans and critics alike. Um, is the 13 minute title track your favorite song on the album or is it something else and why? I mean, no, I, I love the song. It has fantastic transitions. No, Mirror to the Sky as a song. Yeah, that does represent, uh, you know, it does represent the whole album. It tells you much about the whole album. And and the way that the collaboration and the the opportunism that has gone on with these last two albums, you know, with uh, with Thomas Weber at the label, you know, there's been a kind of beautiful uh, uh, symmetry going on, where um, you know we've got tremendous freedom and we've found ways of working that we never would have envisaged, you know, and particularly with me producing it, uh, and um, but you know, with our other experiences in that. I just put my name forward because I said, you know, having somebody inside means we don't have to kind of explain to this other person who doesn't get it what we're mm -hmm. trying to do. <laughs> you know? So yeah, uh, it was it's been enjoyable. But that that song pretty much, I mean, you know, um, circles of time. You know, I mean, the, we love we love the album very much. You know, and particularly unknown place. You know, is another track that. So it's it's been weird. You know, we we kind of put out a little more music than, than we need to each time. Thomas has always felt, yes, fans appreciate getting some lengthy pieces, you know, and uh, that's why we get the bonus CD, which isn't really a bonus at all. We worked on those songs as, as much as we did all the others and just selected how to present them. So, yeah, we're, we're very we're very happy with this this uh, relationship we've got with with each other and the songs and then Thomas and and Sony, it, it, it's been wonderful. And we mentioned this uh, bringing out the steel for a few songs mm. on this album, all connected being yeah. one of them. Um, yeah. When I heard it the first time, it, it to me, it kind of had a little bit of an old school. Yes. Sound to it. Mm. Um, was that something that, that you guys were going for or, it, or was it just standing on its own and it well, just happened to come out that way? Or am I reading I too much into it myself? No, I hope we never can lose that. I mean, if we lose that, we really screwed up. So in a way, I think it is part and parcel that, you know, it's been a bit of a cliche. Many people have been saying, you know, the future has to be, well, in car design, I was just thinking, you know, they say this a lot, you know, when you get a new car, they say, oh, we've taken a lot from the from the older model. And in a way, I think, yeah, I think yes, do that with our music. We, we can't lose all the great, you know, contributions of other people. You know, uh, we're doing it now, but but their contributions have, have stylized, um, it's raised the bar, you know, it's, they were part of the bar raising, you know, uh, 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 personnel who, who made this band what it is today and what it was then, you know, so, you know, we've had a, a tremendous career and, um, you know, I think everybody who's been part of Yes has been proud to be part of Yes and, and that certainly applies to me. Steve, thank you so much for joining us and, and all of your time. I mean, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. Great. Well, nice talking to you. Thank you Ladies and gentlemen, nice. Steve Howe. That's our show for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. And a special thanks of Steve Howe of Yes for joining us once again. Stay safe, everyone. Mm -hmm.